All right, Liz, uh, we are online now. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Liz Sloan, and I'm the president of Worcester Hong Kong and a partner of Stevenson Harwood. This webinar is being jointly hosted by Worcester together with ICS Hong Kong as part of our continued um, collaboration program this year. This is the second in our summer webinar series on charter party disputes and prevention. Um, we look at practical considerations from an industry perspective. It's really wonderful to see so many friends logged on from around the region this evening. Now, many of you will have joined for our first webinar, Safe Port, Eastern City to Ocean Victory and Beyond. If you missed that, you can find the recording um, on our Worcester Hong Kong LinkedIn page, and please like and follow our page. Um, today in this second one hour webinar, we will be looking at tendering NOR, NOR validity issues, and the commencement of lay time. To introduce our panelists for this evening, I'll hand over to Jagmeet. Jagmeet is a maritime arbitrator with expertise in charter parties, bills of lading, shipbuilding and ship finance. He's the chairman of the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers in Hong Kong and is also a member of the Worcester Hong Kong Executive Committee. Thanks very much, Jagmeet. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, friends, I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed panelists to you for today's discussion. Uh, Ms. Vivian Shum, Director of uh, Insurance and Legal. Vivian works in Pacific Basin since the company started in 1987. Pacific Basin operates over 260 ships and owns 120 out of these, mainly Handymaxes, Panamaxes, sorry, Handymaxes, Supramaxes, and Handysize. She has vast experience in operations, charter party disputes, and insurance matters. She works very closely with PNI clubs on the day-to-day -day FTT matters. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you, Jasmine. Mr. Andrew Rigdon Green. Andrew is the head of the Greater China Marine and International Trade Team for Stephenson Harwood. He has more than 20 years experience working in maritime arbitration, both in London and Hong Kong. He frequently represents both owners and charters in disputes arising in respect of lay time and demerit. Andrew is recognized as one of the leading charter party lawyers in Hong Kong and has led the BIMCO masterclass on voice charters on many occasions. Thank you for joining Andrew. Ms. Malin Wong is an English and Hong Kong dual qualified defense lawyer at card and regularly presents in member webinars and podcasts. Previously, she worked at international law firms in London and Hong Kong. Malin has nine years of experience in maritime and commercial law and frequently advises owners and charters in charter party and bills of lading disputes, as well as non-contentious contract reviews and draftings. Malin had a previous career as a computer programmer in top tier investment banks and hedge funds. She's natively fluent in English and Mandarin. Malin, what a wonderful combination. Welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Jagme. Glad to be here. Ms. Tracy Jang, Tracy Jiang is a qualified Chinese lawyer, has an LLB from China University of Political Science and Law, and an LLM from City University of Hong Kong, specializing in maritime and transportation law. Having worked at BG Shipping Company Limited as their senior legal manager, and before that, their senior, uh, before that at Anglo Eastern Ship Management Limited, as their senior claims and insurance officer. She gained rich experience <clears throat> in handling legal claims and insurance matters for ship owners, ship operators, and ship managers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome our panelists. Today's discussion is planned, this is English law, and the topic for today's panel discussion is one of the key dispute areas in the shipping industry. Many of these disputes 
happen due to reasons such as lack of clarity in charter parties or even conflicting wordings, lack of understanding as well as lack of care and communication during the operations. The effect of such pitfalls can be seen in poor risk prevention as well as handling of dispute resolution. We know that the two key statements must be true before a tendered NOR may be considered valid, even if not contractual. Our esteemed and very experienced uh, panelists will consider these statements as well as a number of other issues, including you know, saying a few words about how an invalid NOR sometimes may not prevent lay time from counting. So let's start with uh, Vivian. We would like to hear from you. Okay. Well, a rife ship is what we always hear about in a contract um, of voyage charter, but a rife ship is not an usual problem to us as, as we operate drive out business, but the validity, the validity of the NOR did sometimes happen. As we operate drive out business, the commodity houses have their well-designed charter party clauses and birth term CP is a norm in our business. Is the screen working all right? Yeah, okay. Principally, NOR should be tendered on arrival birth, but master will tender on arrival ports as there may be uncertainties when and where customs clearance is arranged and if the birth is immediately available. Masters are sometimes not given an updated information by the agent. We normally have www clause in a charter party. And what are they? whether in port or not, whether in birth or not, whether in custom clearance or not, whether in free partic or not. Therefore, if vessel have to wait outside port limits when the birth is not available, whether in port or not will assist us in the argument. However, master's attention should be drawn to the NOR clause, which stipulates where NOR can be tendered. It sometimes may contradict the whether in port or not term. We do instruct master to keep tendering NRRs at anchor, at anchorage, at birth, and on host pass if vessel fails beforehand. However, some masters may overlook. In such case, there's a serious risk of losing the time to come before her cargo operations commence, bearing in mind the happy day 2002 is a case law that NOR will become valid only on commencement of cargo operations. Lay time will commence thereafter as per the charter party regime. As per the charter party regime, don't forget, it's not on commencement of the cargo operations. And in this happy day, it actually commenced the next day because I have seen a lot of uh, mistakes actually in some legal documents in some newsletter that they said that lay time to commence on cargo operations but actually by the happy day cases is not it is fell under the regime of the ch charter party of the governing charter party and this will happen the next day on this happy day so it depends on your charter party where the lay time should commence after the nrl is validly tendered also, the Agamemnon 1997 has decided that Southwest Pass is not within port limit, but Baton Rouge. I've seen a very nice picture having been made to allow NOR tender at Southwest Pass and late time can commence. So this is how the commercial side, the chartering desk can assist us in saving this kind of disputes. But the Arando Castle 2017 was also an unhelpful precedent that the owners, because the owners failed to provide evidence that the anchorage position directed by the port authority was not awarded as a valid place within the port limits to tender NOL. It contradicts the House of Lords decision in the Joanna Odendorf 1973 
that waiting place can be decided by the local port authority. In my opinion, this is very dangerous because there are two court cases contradict each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. And coming to Andrew, Andrew, why is there a problem? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jagmeet. Thank you, Vivian, for that uh, excellent introduction. And uh, you did highlight that, that things seem different. And uh, as I was doing some reading for, for today's seminar, I did think, hmm, I wonder why it's all so difficult. And I came across a lecture given by um, a, a former judge, Sir Bernard Eder. And um, he said the first point is an easy one. Um, we can blame the lawyers. Um, a lawyers, he said, um, and he quoted um, from Gulliver's Travels, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He said, lawyers are, are a society bred up from their youth in the art of proving by words multiplied for the purpose that white is black and black is white according to what they're paid. Um, and it's not just um, uh, Jonathan Swift who thought that, but Lord Denning also said that lawyers will so often stick to the letter and miss the substance. They would rather be accurate than clear. They would rather be long than short. They seek to avoid two meanings and end on occasions by having no meaning. But I don't think it's fair to only blame the lawyers, I'm afraid. Um, the second problem that uh, arises is really money. Um, uh, in voyage charters, of course, uh, freight is payable uh, as a lump sum, uh, by usually by reference to the cargo loaded. Um, and within a whole voyage charter cycle, um, there are different portions and the risk of time and therefore delay and therefore money uh, falls on different parties um, and during that time. So it's very important to know when the risk switches from owners to charters and charters to owners, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the instrument for doing so is the notice of readiness. Um, it was set out in, uh, uh, and Vivian uh, kindly referred us to the Joanna Oldendorf uh, from 1973. And uh, it was there that the four parts of the voyage charter were set out so neatly. Um, the first part being the ballast voyage to the load port. Um, and during that, um, during that voyage or that part of the voyage, the risk of delay is on the owner. So if the, the ship is slower or faster, it, it's the owner's problem. Um, the second portion is the loading portion. And during that portion, of course, it's up to the charterer to load the cargo. Um, and there is lay time, of course, but lay time is kind of included in the price of the, of the freight. Um, so that the owner doesn't want to be sitting during lay time for an undetermined period. So the risk of delay and the financial risk of delay is pushed over to charters. Then of course, after that, you have the carrying voyage um, and then the discharging operations. And each point, um, the risk and financial risk shifts uh, from owners to, um, to charters and vice versa. So the NOR is, is that decisive document um, that uh, switches the risk back and forth. Um, I, I'm thinking that if we limit ourselves to five minutes, I'm just going to make one further point here, and then we'll come back to the other points that I've discussed with you, Jeremy. Um, so the, the only point that I want to make now is that in order for an NOR to be valid, there are three criteria that have to be uh, met. Firstly, the ship has to be an arrived ship. Secondly, she has to be ready and in a fit condition to receive or discharge her cargo. Uh, and thirdly, the NOR must be given in accordance with the chance party. Um, but all of those things are open to argument by the lawyers. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. I, I never knew about the... the, the you know, some of the stories that you have said, but absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Malin, uh, shall we hear you now? Yes, please. Well, 
Thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, it's hard to follow Vivian and Andrew because they've both made very, you know, uh, key points about what constitutes a valid NOR. And as Andrew has said, it's all about shifting the financial risk back and forth. So I thought it would be helpful to maybe talk about what lay time means in the first place uh, without going into the details of how you define lay time, such as how many weather working days um, or any of that, because if we want to look at the nitty gritty of how courts and tribunals have decided these things, we could be talking here until next year and we still wouldn't be finished. So I think it's important for everyone to understand that as a general concept, lay time is the contractually allowed amount of time for loading or discharging cargo. And as Andrew said, it's built into the charter party. The price of it has been factored into the freight. If a charter exceeds the agreed lay time, they are in breach of contract. And that's what demurrage is. Demurrage is liquidated damages for the charter's breach in failing to load or discharge within the agreed lay time. The reason this is important is because this is what gives rise to the once on demurrage, always on demurrage concept. I think everyone here has heard that phrase a million times. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that phrase means exactly sometimes. I often see disputes where uh, owners will just say, well, once on demerge, always on demerge, therefore you have to pay. And so I also thought it might be helpful to explain a little bit about what this principle means. Now, first of all, uh, I actually don't really think that we should call once on demerge, always on demerge a principle. What I think it is, is that it is a shorthand expression that summarizes the uh, sort of established English law concepts that have been uh, sort of handed and put uh, decided by judges over the years. So the concepts, all you have to re remember are first, by, exceeded, by exceeding the permitted contractual lay time, charters are in breach. The second is payment of demerge is liquidated damages for that breach. The third is the idea that if charters had complied with their obligation and loaded or discharged cargo within the agreed lay time, then whatever delay that happened after that time wouldn't have happened. And that is why there is now this principle that once the vessel goes on demerge and charters are in breach, anything that happens after that, if charters want to excuse themselves from liability, those uh, events must be very, very clearly worded to as a, de, an exception from uh, demerge. So normally, in charter parties, you will see many clauses that interrupt, reduce, or exclude the counting of lay time, but those things do not automatically apply once the vessel goes on demerge. Okay. The other thing I would like to talk about a little bit, uh, which I think isn't discussed very often, is the reachable on arrival warranty that you find in ASBA tank VOI or often in bulk charter parties, uh, the always accessible uh, requirement. So these clauses, it's been established by uh, the English courts that they more or less mean the same thing, but they have different effects depending on if you're dealing with a port charter or a birth charter. Now, how do you know if your charter party is a birth charter or a port charter? That's a difficult question, and again, that's something that people can, lawyers, I'm, I'm afraid, can argue about until the cows come home. But as a general principle, if you're dealing with a birth charter, which has a reachable on arrival or always accessible warranty, it does not matter if the birth is not reachable for reasons that are completely outside the charter's control. It can be bad weather, uh, tidal uh, conditions, uh, birth congestion, unavailability of tugs, or the port prohibits night navigation, right? A charter might think, but I can't control any of those things. I can't guarantee any of those, those things. I'm sorry, unfortunately, it's been established under English law that if you have this reachable on arrival warranty in your charter party, and even if the birth is not reachable for those reasons, charters, I am afraid you are in breach. And as you can imagine, it is very easy to breach this warranty. Now, in reality, often there aren't many losses that can be attributed that, that wouldn't be covered by the normal lay time and demerge regime and that the owners would want to separately claim for this breach of warranty. But occasionally these arguments do arise, so it's something to bear in mind. 
In a port charter, it's much easier because in that case, the place that must be reachable is the agreed location for tendering the NOR under the charter party. And you know, we can argue about whether the place from which the NOR was tendered is actually the contractually agreed place. But I think everybody normally can agree that normally this is not a huge issue uh, of contention. So it's a much easier obligation to fulfill as com compared to a birth charter. So I think that's my two opening points. Jagmeet, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. So Tracy, so some of the ground has been covered. So looking forward to you covering the rest. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vivian, Andrew, and Malin for the introduction of legal points. And uh, my focus of speech will be on the apply the knowledge to the practice from a loss prevention perspective regarding the commencement of late time and tendering NOR. One of the most productive loss prevention measure is during the negotiation stage. That is before fixing your chat party, familiarize yourself with the requirements, geography, entry procedure extra of the potential ports you are calling. I will talk about some examples to give uh, an, a detailed uh, illustration how to apply the knowledge to the practice. And, uh, I think those areas uh, attract substantial disputes in my experience. So please, but please note that this is not an, an, an intended to be an exhaustive list of what ship owner is advised to find out. So the first example, for some ports, the waiting areas are outside the port limit, as Vivian has mentioned. And this is uh, customary for lots of river ports. If, charter, if the charter is a standard port, charter or a birth or port charter with the whether in birth or not provision without any other provision to advance the position, the ship owner will risk bearing the time lost waiting for birth. It was reaffirmed in the Marata Envoy case that in a standard port charter without special clause, the vessel has to reach within a port limit to tender NOR. It was also said in that case that the words, whether in birth or not, means that the time starts to run when the vessel is with, waiting within the port or for a birth to come, become vacant. So in that case, the vessel was waiting at vessel lightship which is outside port limit of the nominated, nominated port break. So owner end up bearing the waiting time. So if the potential, if the potential um, ports are expected to be serious congested and the waiting areas is not within the port, the ship owner might want to negotiate for other clauses to change the position. What might be help is to like, insert the weather imports or not clause, or as many mentioned, the reachable on arrival warranty clause. Uh, and there are other various clause uh, like time uh, lost, uh, time lost to, to count as late time, etc. And uh, uh, but also pay attention to your exception clause in the chart party because if the exception clause uh, read together with the weather imports or not clause. Uh, the effect is the whether import or not clause starts the clock, but uh, immediately after it starts, the exception clause immediately stopped it. And now the second example, where the obtaining of free practice is not a mere formality, which I think might be um, very relative under the background. And or the, uh, another example is a chat party may make the uh, expressly make the obtaining free practice a condition to tendering NOR. And uh, in some ports, the clearance will only be obtained by the vessel reach a specific place or by the actual attendance of the port authority on board, which might be substantially delayed if the vessel stays in anchorage. In such uh, situations, ship owner might want to advance the time when they can validly tender NOR. But please be reminded that whether in a free predict or not clause in such situation might not be helpful because some arbitrators have suggested that such provisions cannot be relied upon where a delay to grant um, free predict is foreseeable and is not a mere formality. 
Third example is where the formality required prior to uh, tendering NOR need charter or cargo interests cooperation to complete. And the common law position impo only impose reasonable diligence upon charters. So if you need high degree of cooperation, you need to specifically insert a clause to such effect. So after uh, all this familiarization with yourself, even if you identify the risk, it is still very possible that you might not be able to shift the identified risk upon charters as it all depends on the bargaining power. But at least you will have a proper expectation of the risk you are going to take and see if you can uh, shift this risk to like to the other chat other party in the charter chain or you might use this disadvantage of yours to as a bargaining chip to gain other advantage in other aspects of the negotiation yeah that's what i want to say in right now yeah thank, thank you. you tracy so what what i hear from you is that well begun is half done so if you have done your negotiations properly and you've had your charter party clauses uh, very well drafted the interpretation is same between the parties rather than parties having different interpretation and starting the dispute okay andrew i would like to come on yeah Go ahead, thank please. you very, yes thank you uh, tracy it's a, a fantastic suggestion that um, parties properly negotiate and, and i absolutely agree that in terms of um loss prevention and risk management if parties properly put their minds to um, issues such as um, a, a late time clauses and uh, when and where notice readiness should be tendered, um, they will avoid a lot of, um, of disputes. And obviously we've seen in the last uh, two years, um, people uh, very concerned about infectious diseases and, and that the, the kind of impacts that that has on uh, loading and discharge of cargoes. So, so that's that's great. Um, I think there are two things that I would also just add into that. One, um, as a general, well, as a general, as many many people are quite sloppy in um, their charter party negotiations, um, as you well know. Um, and uh, I love to do this thing when trainees arrive in our firm. And I'll give them a fixture recap and I'll give them a, um, a, a, a pro forma and I'll give them rider clauses and I'll say, so what's the contract? Where, where is the dispute resolution clause? That sort of thing. And, and you've got kids who've come out of law school who've been very used to seeing beautiful negotiated contracts like you rightly suggest we should do. And then they dive into the world of shipping and realize that there's layer upon layer upon layer of different contracts all working together and people don't really know what they've agreed. And then the other point I would just make is that sometimes um, when we try and define something and we try and be precise about it, um, we end up falling into another trap um, because we can't always look for every single circumstance. Um, and so we, we'd end up with a situation where we've kind of overdefined um, situation. And I, I was going to refer to a case called the Alpha Harmony. And I don't know where, whether people are familiar with it. It's a relatively recent case. Um, but the Alpha Harmony uh, was a, um, at the reported judgment. Um, it, it was uh, related to a chain of charter parties. Um, and the charter parties were very, very similar about um, when the notice of readiness should be tendered, except that the sub-charter um, said that it should be tendered um, during office hours. And the head charter didn't have such a, um, a provision. And that meant that the party in the middle was stuck with paying for the demurrage um, despite the fact that they they were just in the middle they were just passing things through and, and like you say tracy they hadn't properly got a back-to-back -back charter party chain um and so you know mitigating your risk by making sure that you're back to back but it was just such a small amendment very very small amendment 
um, and uh, and these tiny things can can give quite big risks. Yeah, Andrew, I must tell you, it happens in the real world. I've been doing uh, myself fixing. What happens is when you have an operator, you got head owner, and you you know got somebody else on the other side. People sometimes some people try to be very smart. They tweak these terms, thinking that everything will move in their favor and they will make some little bit of extra money. And then it goes other way around. And fantastic what you what you and uh, Tracy and everybody came out with. It's all about the way we do business in shipping. I mean, when we still continue to you continue to use 1946, and then the charter party executed one looks like a battle ground, battlefield. We don't want to use 2015 NYP, right? We don't want to use proper clauses, which BIMCO has spent so many years with so much of input. Ah, that's what happens. Now, you mentioned about the infectious diseases, uh, Andrew. So my next question is going to be an open one. And uh, I would like everyone to give your views. Actually, when participants registered for the webinar, there were four or five questions related to COVID-19. So I would like to know how has that affected the vessel's readiness to load and uh, its ability to tender a valid NOR. Let's start with, um, let's say, Vivian. Okay. Well, for us, 95% of our charter are birth term charters. So suppose the NOR has to be tendered on arrival birth. <laughs> so when this quarantine is required, is needed on arrival port, is some sort of a free fatigue. If the birth is vacant, then the owners will have a serious problem because they have to arrive birth to tender the NOR. But if the birth is occupied, then the problem goes back to the charterer because if, if it's a port charter or the birth is congested, it will be the charter's responsibility that uh, uh, the ship have to, if the birth is congested, then the ship have to wait. But still, birth availability is a priority. It's the first thing that the charter's uh, responsibility. So fortunately, in that case, we can hold the charter's responsible if COVID, under the COVID that the quarantine is required. But on the other way wrong, if the birth is vacant, then well, the owners, unfortunately, will get stuck on, on, on this case, in my opinion. But it depends very much on the charter party too. Nowadays, I think the charter parties, they try to put COVID to one party's account. Depends how the charter party is fixed in due course. Yeah. I just to, yeah, please. Sorry, Malin. just to jump in following on what uh, Vivian just said. I, yeah. I mean, you would think that in this day and age, everybody would have provided for COVID issues when they're fixing uh, ships, but sometimes you still come across the odd charter party where they don't. And then there's a big argument about who ought to be responsible for the quarantine time. And uh, there's, I think, I an argument to be made in the situation that Vivian just described where it's a birth charter and the birth is unavailable at the time the ship arrives. So there's a whether in birth or not clause. So the ship tenders the NOR, but then let's say sometime during the quarantine period, let's say it's 14 days. And then halfway through that, the birth becomes available. Then who's responsible for the remaining seven days? And there can be an argument can be made that the owners ought to be responsible because this port was named in the fixture recap. So owners should have been, uh, they, they are taken to have accepted the risks of quarantine at that birth because it was a named port. If it's a time charter, then the situation is completely different. But in a voyage charter, the, uh, the, there's a general sense that the more the owner knows about which port they're going to, the more they are taken to have accepted the risks at that port. So it's something to consider. I've seen this argument made. Yeah, but yeah. sometimes yeah. When, when the charter is fixed or the ship arrived, actually the rules changed. 
just the yes, day. And, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then and then and then you can also argue. I'm just saying one can argue. Well, oh, and everybody knows in this day and age the rules can change. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's also well, a risk that the owners yeah. have taken on. It's it's very difficult. I agree. Yeah, always argument, yep. right? <laughs> hey, that's why we have jobs, right? <laughs> No, no, you're you absolutely right. When when it all started last year, of course, there were there were a lot of uncertainties, even today, as you say. But uh, in voice charter, of course, if the owner is aware of a named port, and, and if the charter party says that owners are responsible for checking any restriction whatsoever, then it, it becomes difficult for them to, to get away from that. Uh, Tracy, anything? Yeah, I actually I have been dealing these cases, and I think the arguments I have been I had faced faced is that one is like whether the free practice is a mere formality or not anymore, and uh, uh, I like as a common law position, the absence of free practice will not prevent a notice of readiness from being given, provided the medical condition of the crew is such that critique can be give, uh, obtained without subsequent delays where this is considered to be formality. And also, uh, but Lord Denning said in the uh, Dillian export case and as an orbiter that, I can understand that if a ship is known to be infected by a disease such as to prevent her getting her pratique, she would not be ready to load or discharge. But if she has apparently a clean bill of health such that there is no reason to fear delay, then even though she has not been given her pratique, she is entitled to give notice of readiness and late time where begin to run. Now we put such a speech into the context. I don't, I find it difficult to see that in, under the background, you will find that uh, it is uh, uh, expected that the ship will suffer no delay to obtain free, free practice. Usually you will have a PCR test before Entry or, or, or entry, so I I don't have I have difficulty in, in thinking that the free party is mere formality anymore. Yeah, and yep. yeah, that's my point. Yeah, of view. I think uh, Andrew can can tell us more whether Delian Spirit seventy one still holds good in COVID uh, times. I'm putting me on the spot. I I would say actually it's a really interesting point, and it, and Tracy's really made the point that I was going to make. Um, and it sort of neatly brings me on to sort of, I talked about lawyers, I talked about money, I talked about NORs, but the other thing that, that really does throw a spanner in the works is what we call the factual, factual matrix. So what are the facts and circumstances that surround the particular circumstance? So uh, as Tracy said, if free pratique is in fact a mere formality, um, then we maybe we are still there, but uh, having seen the reactions of health authorities around the world to the threat of COVID, um, uh, free protect, free protect may no longer be that mere formality. And we can say on the one hand, well, the law is this. This is what the law says, and we can argue that, but the law hasn't yet caught up with. The factual matrix you know it hasn't yet caught up with where we are in reality so i think it would be quite um quite a bold move given the circumstances at present to be hinging a case on the basis that free pratique is a mere formality i think that would be quite um quite gutsy um because i think that that we do accept now that there are procedures in place that, that delay ships in order to get a clean bill of health. Yep. Um, yeah. And I, um, yeah, there was a, the, the other related point is really about whether, and this might be controversial, whether and it's completely straying off topic, but might give you some food for thought, whether COVID is in fact, um, a dangerous disease or not. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's just a yeah. question. I'll just put it out no, there. That's right. when more, more, and, more and more countries are changing from pandemic to endemic, hopefully soon, then maybe the entire thing will change. Coming back to you, Tracy, I mean, you know, dispute, though there are lawyers here, arbitrators here, but disputes, basically, what does that mean? Is just wastage of money, time, opportunities, souring of relationships. So what what would you, you know, like to tell the guys on the front line? Uh, how can they do favors to their organizations? Uh, uh, I still think the most ex- effective ways, of course, uh, in negotiation stage, but when you do have agreement and uh, in the operation stage, uh, I do suggest that even though the master is aware of the NOR provision, and but we still have a, a sure personnel to monitor the a, a execution of the tendering of the NOR to make sure because master can have, have so much jobs in um, approach the board. And uh, so, and they might uh, miss them something and they might not uh, understand the legal points fully. So it is advisable to uh, uh, still monitor master's exercise of the NOR and to make sure it tendered on every possible opportunity. And uh, after the uh, operation stage, if in any event a dispute uh, or potential dispute occurred, and uh, of course, the first thing usually will be investigation. And uh, you will ask for the bill of leading statement of facts and uh, as various documents. And uh, I think uh, I find the lineup report is also very valuable. Uh, so there, also there is no obligation on charters to birth a vessel in strict term of her arrival, but there are a few possible things you can get from lineup report. For example, if uh, it, it might be proof whether the birth is congested, uh, which will be useful when you have a cross putting the waiting time due to congestion on charters. Another example is that you might be able to find out on the lineup report why the bus is congested, like whether it is an obstacle created by charters, which if it is, it might give you a defense, even if it is a bus charter, because if a bus is prevented or delayed from becoming an arrived ship by obstacles created by charter or those for whom he is responsible, the general principle is that the charter becomes liable for the delay. Uh, like in the Atlantic Sunbeam case, it was said that there is an implied term that a charter must act within reasonable dispatch and in accordance with the ordinary practice to the port to in- in- enable a vessel to become an arrived ship. So thus will require you to really dig into the details to find out the underlying reason why the vessel was delayed. So this is very important. Another experience I would like to share is that don't just rely on what the one document says uh, about the true state of fact. It is always advisable to corroborate your evidence, to cross-check your understanding of the documents with crews or with the agents, and uh, uh, if vessel is delayed by an order from Port Authority, find out who made the order, on what legal or regulation basis such order is made, because it might affect the nature of the order, and uh, get a copy of the order if it is written. And after the investigation, uh, you will have a preliminary view what the legal issue is and whether our case is good or not. The next, next thing I would do is to talk to other departments and chartering our cooperation colleague to operation colleague to find out what we want to achieve. Uh, this is for consideration for proper um, dispute resolution to find out whether the issue concerning the dispute is a matter of 
principle and uh, we want to we really want to make a stand or whether we want to maintain the commercial relationship uh, while protect our interest as much as possible if it is a formal we might want to involve internal lawyers assistance as early as possible because whether it is arbitration or tri uh, trial it takes longer times and the law is constantly evolving like in the uh, Maratha and Envoy case, uh, when the, the uh, contract is actually agreed, the test was still the Parker test. But when the case br brought to the trial, the test became the retest. So it affects the owner's position. And uh, given also, you might want to consider the financial background of your client. And this is the general, general consideration in underlying every dispute resolution. Uh, if it is a letter that like you want to maintain the relationship, in my experience, uh, it is usually the letter uh, because in the end, the uh, opponent is your client. So adversarial uh, dispute resolution might not be our first choice. Uh, choose the proper communication channel, explain the legal position, and then to reach a settlement is more helpful. And one solution I found that gain popularity is to reach a settlement where it is linked to further and future transactions. This way it might be able to create a win-win solution. Yeah. Fantastic. What you mean is ships and relationships, right? So yeah. It's all about ships and relationships. Relationships, yeah. yeah. All right. Andrew, uh, this one is uh, for you, one of the questions which I got when uh, participants registered. The, the NOR is often given at the port of loading when the vessel is not actually ready to load the cargo. Most of the charter party BIMCO forms protect owner's interests. Where the NOR is not expressly accepted by the charter, but is otherwise signed by them as, as per charter party, the terms of which provide specifically that owners to give NOR when the vessel is ready to commence loading at the load port. This was the background of the question. Question comes now. Okay, has the, has the NOR been accepted because charter's agents did not expressly object are ladies to commence where the vessel is not ready, uh, nor even at the loading berth? Oh, thank you, Jagmeet. Uh, <laughs> um, like any of these questions, they don't have a simple or straightforward answer. Um, lawyers love to avoid answering the questions by saying it depends. Um, Melina's laughing because um, yeah, she used to use that all the time as well. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, yes, the, 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 the first place you'd look for, um, for some kind of, of authority or guidance is your charge party to see what that says. But um, just uh, receiving the NOR and not rejecting it does not necessarily mean that it's been accepted. Um, but then um, if, you're, and if your vessel is not factually ready, then the NOR can't actually in fact be tendered. So I think that the, it comes back down to the factual matrix. Is the vessel or is the vessel not ready to receive cargo? Um, now there may be some protection within the charter party wording itself about readiness of the vessel, um, but if there's not, then, then the answer is, is pretty much that that's not a valid tender of NOR. Right, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, coming to Malin and uh, Vivian, uh, one of the points which comes out from what has been discussed just now is the London Arbitration 13 by 19. Uh, what should a charter do if a vessel tenders an invalid NOR or say what precautions should a charter and even his agents take to prevent the outcome dealt with within the uh, London Arbitration 13 by 19? So let's start with Malin. Well, so um, the London Arbitration 13 slash 19 uh, relates to a case where the vessel tendered an invalid NOR because its holds were not ready. 
but then subsequently the uh, I think the agent the local agent took that NOR and submitted it to the port to apply for port clearance uh, birth birthing clearance and that action by the agent was held by the tribunal to constitute an acceptance of that invalid NOR and the one of the things to bear in mind is that I think generally it is accepted that the actions of the agent um, and also also the actions of the shippers and receivers at the port uh, um, will be considered the actions of the charter. So if one of them has accepted the, done something to accept the NOR, then charters might be taken to have accepted the NOR as well. So that's something to remember. In this particular case, I think the problem is that um, it's, it's established under English law that when an invalid NOR is tendered, you can, a charter can stay silent, and silence itself under English law is generally not considered to be sort of um, acceptance of anything, right? Whether it be a contract or an NOR, just mere silence is not usually good enough to amount to acceptance by a charter. But, uh, now the problem is what if subsequently in addition to being silent, the charter did something which suggests that they might have accepted the NOR. So uh, the official legal term for that is uh, estoppel by uh, convention or uh, by conduct. So the question, so the difficulty is when the charter does something that can be deemed to be acceptance of the NOR, and it's very hard to define what that might what that might be. So I think the outcome in London arbitration 13 slash 19 is a bit surprising to a lot of us. Um, I think it's quite it, it's very frequent for people to submit an NOR to apply for a port clearance, even if you don't accept that the NOR is valid. So I think the way to get around this um, perhaps might be don't just stay silent. If, if your charter and an, an NOR has been tendered, maybe it's valid, maybe it's not valid, you're not sure yet, but don't just say silent, stay silent. You should, if you're sure it's not valid, then reject it outright. Um, and if you're not sure, then perhaps you can consider accepting it without prejudice or accepting it subject to all the terms of the charter party. It's suggested in some of the relevant commentary that these words might be enough to protect the charter and from being deemed to have accepted an invalid NOR. Right. Thank you. Vivian, uh, do you really think uh, this was a controversial case? And as Malin said, there is some room into it for discussion. Definitely controversial. Actually, I totally don't understand how could this happen because there's a specific clause in this charter party required NOR to be retended on failure of the host. So it wasn't done. And applying for birth is a normal procedure and charters not even get involved to accept an NOR or give instructions to an agent to apply for a birth. You know, birth and terminal and agents, they all work locally, while the charters may be 100, well, in a foreign country, 100 miles away, we don't know. But this one is have a specific clause in the charter party. How could that happen that uh, an invalid NOR is accepted uh, just because the agent used it to apply for the birth? So uh, this is a, a arbitration case. This is not a court case. So it could have another, if it appealed to court, it could have another result, which I don't know. But uh, th this case also have another interesting point is the tribunal decided that late time had commenced on the first working day after the hurricane. Whilst the ship was still aground since the first day of the hurricane, it was 15 days before the ship refloated. Late time commenced during a hurricane and the ship is not at the charter's disposal. So this is something pretty difficult for uh, uh, charters to accept, I think from a commercial side. Though I understand that uh, you don't think that if the, sh if the birth is not available or you, that uh, you, you charters can wash hand, even the ship is not available to you. But on this one, 
it's not. It's, it's an arbitration case show that, that even the ship was grounded and not at the charter's disposal. And once the hurricane, the weather working day is, is over, or the uh, under the force virtual clause is over, then it's immediately late time to commence. So this is besides the NOR issue is, is very strange to me. This decision is strange to me too. Yeah, I know. I think it's, close, uh, it, yeah. it's, it's just worth picking up on Vivian's point that this is an arbitration decision. Um, and because it's an arbitration decision, it means it's not binding law. Um, so, so in one sense, it, it, it might be out there, it might be published, uh, some people might be swayed by it, but, but it doesn't necessarily represent the law. Um, and perhaps people who are arbitrators on this, on this call need to be aware that, that actually people would be able to argue against that. Melina, I see you've got a point too. Well, actually, Angie, you made exactly the point that I wanted to raise because in my day-to-day -day dealings with our members, I often have to remind people that arbitrations are not binding law. And they, they get an arbitration report and they hold it up like it's gospel, but it's not. So it's just yeah, worth, worth yeah. bearing in mind. Yeah, at best it is persuasive. It's not, it's not the binding law. And, and the clause 77 in that particular charter party, if I recall, it clearly says that NCB's uh, passing of the holds, uh, only after that the master has to tender the NOI. Anyway, let's move on from there. Uh, Andrew and Tracy, for you, this is one of the observations. Again, it's a bit, bit longish one from one of my uh, uh, participants at the time of registration. Uh, following on from such cases as the Maratha Envoy, it would be interesting giving continuing developments in effective communication, whether under a similar scenario, the same decision over NOR valid, validity would be made. Uh, there is little doubt that the basic concepts of arrival, effective disposition, control, and readiness should be followed, but with modern methods of effective communication becoming even more efficient perhaps circumstances may arrive uh, justifying a reconsideration. Now the Maratha envoy and the river visa, uh, what, what do you think, Andrew? Well, I was just gonna, um, <laughs> there's an interesting decision, which is uh, 2013, so it's not, it's not super new, uh, called the Port Russell, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but the Port Russell was on a BP VOI form and it was unamended. NOR was tendered using modern communication, i.e. by email. Um, and uh, that was not contractual because under the contract, it had to be by fax, telex, carrier pigeon or something, but email was not included, even though later on in the, in the charter party, uh, notices and communications were to be done by email. Um, so I think it's one of these things where we have to be super careful. Um, and, and Tracy was so spot on earlier when she was talking about uh, looking carefully at your contracts to start with and negotiating correctly, because people will just, uh, well, we'll just use the BP form. Uh, it's fine. You know, it, it's been used for centuries and, and it's always been interpreted this way. Um, but if you don't update your charter parties to include modern communication methodologies, then you're stuffed. And if your charter party says the NOR must be tendered on pink paper and you tender it on blue paper, it's not an NOR. Um, it's, it's a really big departure from the, the sort of principles or what we would say are the principles of English law. So in English law, we often say, oh, well, the judges look at the purpose, they look at the intention, they don't look at the form or the format. But when it comes to NORs, they look at the form and the format, um, which is yep. counterintuitive. Tracy. Yeah, actually, I, I totally agree. I, I, I don't think there is some necessity to change it uh, from my point of view. And uh, I, I, I think the law, is, uh, now the law has reached a certain degree of certainty and the people know what to do now. If they like, uh, if the 
common law position is this, and we need to have uh, which clause to amend it, and what how the clause is interpreted. So if um, we are going to change that, I think we will face another error that we, we are having, like before the retest is established, we will have a uh, lot of uncertainties face it. And uh, I think, uh, and I have read a an, um, speech um, given by Lord De Depok in his judgment in the Joanna Odendorf. And the, um, uh, the, yeah, in that case, uh, 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 the uh, Lord Diplock said that the waiting places within the limits of an extensive port, which have these mentioned characteristics, alter as ships become more maneuverable, faster or larger, and the communications between ship and the shore improve. It seems to me that uh, by establishing establishing the principle that the vessel need to reach within port limit to tender NOR, he expected the interpretation of port limits will be expanded by the development of the technology, but not by changing the uh, common law position. So I, I don't think he, uh, he would have the appetite to change that. And yeah, that's my point of view. I have to say, I think what I envision will happen is exactly cool. what Tracy said, because everyone, there's so much certainty now because there's such an established body of case law and nobody has the appetite to go and rock the boat, so to speak. So we will continue with these established principles since those are the rules of the game and everybody understands them. And there's, it's just, it, it doesn't seem like there's any need to change it, even though it might be a bit clunky and even though it might feel a bit inefficient sometimes, at least everybody understands. Yep, so I think now before, before we take on a few more questions, uh, can I have, if you had like two minutes each or something like that to come out with your pearls of uh, wisdom for all of us? I'm the only non-lawyer here, though an arbitrator, but any pearls of wisdom for mortals like me? Thank you. Let, let's start with Vivian. Okay, okay. all right. Um, well, well, I heard about a lot of criticism on the commercial side that uh, chart contracts are fixed in a sloppy way, <laughs> but I, I try to give them a bit more defense because customers is gold in some, most of the time, well, cargo is gold. So I, I'm told sometimes they have to fix the business in a very short time in order to get the ship moved. So, and, and we have big customers like uh, Valleys or Rio Tinto. You can't really change their charter parties. I was told probably a bit brain stop. So, and, but they, I can see that our charting, well, our commercial side, they try to do things better nowadays, try to change the charter parties. As I said earlier, that uh, NOR can be tendered at Southwest Pass, which is outside port limits in the Mississippi River sometimes. So, so yes, I think uh, as, as everyone said here, that uh, contract terms is what we have to focus on, is what you can care, but on the other side, we have to take care of the commercial side as well. So um, I, I also endorse uh, Melaine's point on always accessible. This is a very good point to help the birth term charter that in, in case the birth, uh, but even on birth term CP, if the, you have always accessible and it's not accessible, then you can have a damage claim against your charters. Even lay time is not to count because a valid NOR was not tendered at birth, then you can submit a damage claim. And uh, as we all said about NOR, where to tender, how to make it valid, that's the point that everybody has focused on is where you tender and keep on tendering without prejudice to the prior tender. This is 
something that we have to remind the operator and the master. Tender at the on arrival port, at anchorage, at berth, and if you fail on uh, after pass, the second pass, that's the first pass, then please retender. This is something to remember. And uh, um, also, of course, the arbitration case 1319, which is we, we look for it to have appeal in court, <laughs> is to give someone the charters have something in mind that uh, the birth congested, when the birth is congested, don't think that you will win. Even the ship is not available, it's not. So the birth congestion will give you a problem. So when, when you look at that, you have to bear in mind that late time could commence if the ship is not available. That's, that's my three points. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Malin? Thanks, Jagmeet. Well, so at the risk of sounding like a broken re record, I have to repeat what Vivian said about tendering, retendering, and tendering again your NORs because you never know when a ship might later be found to be not ready. For example, in this day and age, um, let's say your ship arrives at the port, at, yeah, at a discharge port, and you wait a few days to before you're allowed to berth. And at the berth, you carry out PCR tests and you find out 14 of, out of 19 crew members are infected with COVID. And then all of a sudden, that means your ship does not comply with safe manning requirements and that NOR you tendered three days ago was not valid. So always tender, you, you just never know when your ship might retrospectively be found to be not ready. And NORs are like chocolates, you can never have too many of them. Now the next uh, piece of advice I would have is, I've seen charter parties which have the words, principle of once on demerge, always on demerge, not to apply to this charter party. It's my own view that this clause achieves nothing. So if you want to circumvent the once on demerge, always on demerge principle, the way to do that is have very clearly worded exceptions clauses, such as blah, blah, blah time, not to count if vessel, uh, not to count as lay time or demerge if vessel is on demerge. That's the best way, the clearest way you can uh, ensure that this time will not count as demerge. And lastly, if you are a charter negotiating a birth charter such as ASBA tank Foy, um, or a birth charter that has the always accessible uh, warranty. Now Vivian very rightly pointed out that if you're an owner, you absolutely want this always accessible or reachable on arrival warranty because that helps you. If you're a charter and if you are able to convince the owners to accept it, you can consider putting in a rider clause that says, for the purposes of the reachable on arrival or always accessible warranty, the place that must be reached is the place, the contractually agreed place for tendering the NOR. And then in a way that actually <laughs> negates the effect of the always accessible or reachable on arrival warranty. But anyway, this is a matter for, I'm not advocating that people do this. I'm just saying it's, it's, it, it will depend on the party's respective bargaining powers. Oh, I, I took it very seriously that you are, you are going to penalize the ship owners twice. One, the charters have breached their late time obligation and after that making the owner suffer for the force majeure. Yeah. Oh, if, no, no, if, no. If, <laughs> Force majeure is another thing altogether. Yeah, that's another topic. <laughs> All right. Um, Tracy, I'm going to give Andrew the last word. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I just want to summarize generally what I mentioned that is, uh, as Jack Mick mentioned in the beginning, so it is very important to bridge the gap between knowing and doing. And this needs cooperation actually from various departments. The starting point is knowing where you're standing law, which uh, we are usually uh, carried out by your legal uh, advisor and uh, know how the various clause you will be interpreted and and what the common law says about your position. Then you will have a prelim preliminary review that you need to find out to properly evaluate your potential 
risk. Offset address the potential identified issue in negotiation stage and think of various ways to mitigate the risk of dispute and loss. And after the contract has been agreed, monitor the execution. That is very important as it has been uh, mentioned repeatedly by Vivian and uh, Malin, just tender, retender, and NOR. And uh, I think it is also very important. Uh, I, and if any dispute uh, di cannot be avoided, carry out a thorough and a detailed investigation as I elaborated previously. After you know of your, the merits of your case, you will be in a proper position to think about the choice of various available dispute resolutions as suit your intention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jagmeet. And not sure um, summing up or following these fantastic ladies is, <laughs> is really possible. Um, Vivian, you're absolutely right. I, I know we joked about um, contracts, but uh, actually getting the contracts through the door and making sure that we have cargo on board the ships to make the ships go around the world is, is so important. Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the priority has to be that. Um, uh, Obviously, when it comes to the contracts, um, Tracy, you make the right point that we need to look closely at them. If we don't have time, um, if we're trying to do things quickly, we can use shortcuts. We can use um, nice standard wordings. There are a lot of standard wordings that have been produced by BIMCO that are very helpful. Um, if we start to amend them, we might begin to change our obligations more than we thought. Um, always look at the wordings, always look at them closely if you can, um, and, and don't make assumptions about what you can and cannot do. Um, I think that those, those are salient points. I would just say um, a couple of uh, other things. Um, uh, and Malene, we didn't talk about the running of late time because that's not the topic of today. Malene did bring it up rightly, and I would say be warned that there is a difference between exceptions to lay time and the running of lay time. Um, so if you want um, there to be exceptions to the running of lay time, the general principle under English law is that you must specifically say that this exception applies to lay time. Otherwise, it, it won't. It won't apply at all. Um, and that's just, uh, it's a strong principle and that's the way it is. And the other big warning is um, in the MTM Hong Kong, which was decided, I think, in 2019 or 2020, um, uh, about making claims for demurrage supported by all documents. Um, and if you don't do it within time and you don't have absolutely every document, then you, you, you will be time barred for bringing a demurrage claim. So, I mean, I, I think that the, the law is quite harsh in that decision. Um, but that's the current state of it. Um, so there's things to be careful of. Um, they're not unmanageable. Um, uh, and uh, every single situation is different. Um, I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest takeaway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Now, since you talked about the good practices, I would like to add one over here. Uh, we always say that you don't need to uh, have a written or signed charter party or contract to, to be a contract under English law. But I, I understand there are some jurisdictions where you need to have a signed contract to evidence the arbitration clause. So this is one thing. Would you like to add something? Maybe we got a couple of minutes. Uh, Andrew, Malene, anyone would like to add on to it? It's something important for the audience to, to pay so attention it's, to. It's a bit of a, I mean, it's a bit of a, a sort of a, a a diversion, a digression away from NORs, but um, certainly if you are looking to enforce uh, arbitration awards um, in jurisdictions where the arbitration has not been seated, so say you have a Hong Kong arbitration award, you want to enforce that in mainland China, when you come to the Chinese court to um, uh, to enforce your award, you have to present not just the award, but also the um, the arbitration agreement, and you have to show to the Chinese court that it's a it, it's a signed agreement between the parties. And very, very frequently, and we talked about uh, charter parties that are 
uh, formed by the exchange of emails, etc. But um, if you don't have a signed arbitration agreement, it's going to be much more difficult for you to um, enforce your arbitration award, in, in, particularly in, in mainland China, but also in, in a lot of other civil law jurisdictions around the world. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, anyone, anything? Quick 30 seconds. Vivian, now? All right, so I would like to thank all of our panelists, Andrew, Malene, uh, Tracy, and Vivian, thank you so much. Uh, and of course, uh, Liz, I think this has been a fantastic second webinar uh, of the series. And I'm so happy as the chairman of the ICS Hong Kong to, to have started this collaboration between Vista Hong Kong and ICS. Let's, let's continue to do this more and more. And to all the audience, thank you very much for joining. And uh, in case there are any questions which we haven't answered, uh, please know that we will uh, get these answers and email the answers to you. Thank you so very much. Shall we do a quick plug for our next webinar, Jagmeet, which will be yes. on the, the 13th of October, uh, which will be on the issues uh, related to bills of lading and letters of indemnity. So that's really topical. Um, we've seen a lot of misdelivery claims recently. So that will be a really interesting one. And I think quite contentious as well, because there are some quite um, polarizing views on, on, on LOIs and misdelivery claims. So keep that date in mind, 13th of October. And we look forward to seeing you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thanks, uh, Wister. Thanks, Jack.